Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Whitney Fish and I am the Executive Director of the Hill at Miami University. And it's such a pleasure to welcome you to our Women Crush Wednesday series. The series was created with the idea in mind of connecting students with thought leaders, experts in various fields. And in this case, really wanted students to connect with the incredible Yasmin, who does wonderful work of advocacy, especially around Sephardic, Mizrahi, and Bukharan Jewish communities, as well as just calling out the Ashkenormativity that runs rampant within the Jewish community. We at the Hillel at Miami University represent and are here for all Jews in every aspect of their journey at the, in Oxford. We are nestled in Oxford, Ohio. It is currently very cold outside. And there's snow everywhere. And it is such a pleasure also to introduce everyone to our student leader, Madison McQueen, who is the queen of Women Crush Wednesday and will be running this interview today. We'll be leading this interview in a traditional interview style conversation between Maddie and Yasmin. And then at the end, there will be time for question answer. Along the way, you're welcome to throw questions in the chat. But again, those questions will not be asked until the end. Um, I also want to just remind everyone, because unfortunately we have to, that this is a safe space, that any kind of negative, derogatory, hurtful language messaging will be, will result in immediate removal from the, from this conversation and from this space. Um, with that being said, let me just introduce you please to Yasmin. Yasmin is a Mizrahi Bukharan Ashkenazi Jew who is a first generation American on her father's side. Both sides of her family were victims of violent anti-Semitism from the Shoah in Hungary to living as, and I'm not gonna say this correctly, can you please pronounce this word for me? Dim Dimis? It's D-H-I-M-M-I-S. Yep. Dimmies. Mm -hmm. I said it right. Amazing. Thank you. Dimmies in yep. Syria and Uzbekistan. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yasmin is passionate about decolon decolonizing Jewish history and identifying as, excuse me, and identify as well as shining a light on the stories most underrepresented in our community. Yasmin was also raised in a Black and Jewish home and is now raising Black and Jewish children herself, which, drive, which drives her passion to address anti-Blackness in our community. She's a full-time mother and wife and uses her Instagram page as a journal to share experiences, observations, and ways she believes we can make our community better. Please welcome Yasmin to our Women Crush Wednesday series. Hi. Just so you know, you're breaking up just a little. So if there's a delay on my ends, you're cutting out just a little bit. It's always hard to get to the connections working with. Zoom. It's like mm -hmm. the only bad part about, well, not the only bad part about the pandemic, but <laughs> definitely a highlight. Um, yeah, so it's so wonderful to have you with us today, Yasmin. I am actually pretty excited myself because I also am from a white and Black um, Jewish background, and it's definitely very difficult just because there's so many people unlike that in like the very like majority of the Jewish community. Um, mm -hmm. So I would love to just hear about your childhood to start off with. I'm always interested to see kind of like where people's roots started. Sure. Okay. So um, I'm going to, for the sake of clarity and less confusion. So there's my mom, there's my Abba, who's my biological father. And then there's my dad who raised me. Um, so my mom is Ashkenazi and her family, you know, they came from Hungary and Russia through Ellis Island. Um, way before the Shoah, but a lot of my mom's family in Hungary stayed behind and essentially lost 35 people, uh, parents and children. My Abba's family, he came here, I wanna say in the late seventies, just a couple of years before I was born. Um, and his family is from Syria and Uzbekistan, they're Quran Jews. Um, and as I said, they lived as Demi. So they lived as second class, if they're citizens persecuted and oppressed by Arab and Muslim supremacy in these countries. Um, my parents actually got divorced when I was like two um, and just a lot of trauma and abuse. I actually ended up severing ties with my biological father, um, who I look like, who I get a lot of my information or had gotten a lot of my information from about Mizrahi history. And my mom married my dad, who's my stepdad, but he's my dad. Um, and he's not Jewish. He's black um, and he's agnostic. And that shaped 
pretty much who I am today. Um, because my mom is Jewish, but secular, my dad is black and there's no religion. I mean, we celebrated Christmas and Easter, but that's like, I think pretty standard American non-Jewish things to celebrate, even if you don't go to church. Um, so even at a very young age, anti-blackness has been something that I've always been passionate about dismantling and confronting. It's something I saw my own dad go through at the hands of my mom's family. So like we had family members that would not come in our house, which is fine. We didn't want them there, but that's how we found out. Like they wouldn't come in the house because they found out that my mom's boyfriend at the time was black. Um, I had family members not show up to my wedding because my husband's black. Um, again, things that we didn't necessarily know before these situations arose. And then on top of that, we're from Brooklyn. So living in Brooklyn as a black and Jewish family, I saw daily the way that Jewish people in the community treated our family, whether it was, you know, following my dad around the store, whether it was asking questions like, do you live here? Do you belong here? Um, or when I took, you know, my, I have brothers too, and my brothers are black and Jewish. And whether it was like constantly staring at me and my brothers, just things that I think any black person knows what non-black people do to make them feel uncomfortable or to other them is what my family has experienced. So a lot of people attribute my passion for confronting racism to being with my husband. And I mean, yeah, okay. I've been with my husband 20 years. I have two teenage children. That's definitely a big thing, but this is way deeper than my marriage. This is part of who I am and how I was raised. I was raised in a black family submerged in black culture and I was loved and protected by the Black community and my Black family. And I saw the pain and I saw the abuse that my dad and his siblings and were enduring, again, not just by white people, not just by Jews, but by my own Jewish family. And it made me really, it actually made me separate myself a lot from the Jewish community growing up because I cut ties with every family member that was racist I don't talk to anymore. Um, one of my cousins called my brother, the N word. And this was a cousin that I had raised. Like I was there when he was, came into the world, raised him. I completely cut ties. So the things I talk about on my page are for me, they're not activism or they're not, you know, everyone else is talking about this. This is something that I have been dealing with and talking about forever because it truly has affected the people that I love the most in this world. Um, and it just made me see that even though Jews have always been othered um, and targeted, you know, especially, you know, by white supremacy, there's also levels of privilege that non-Black Jews, whether it doesn't matter what Jew kind of Jew you are, whether, you know, Ashkenazi, it doesn't matter. If you're not Black, you hold privilege um, in this country. And it's often weaponized to cause harm or, you know, to further your own, you know, advancement while pushing other people behind. Um, and I say this equally because I have Ashkenazi family that's very white functioning, that is racist. And I have Mizrahi family that you would think is Arab that is equally as anti-Black. So it's not a, a, a discussion that is only for a certain part of our community. It doesn't matter whether you're white passing or not, whether you're brown or not, if you're not Black, I think there's a conversation that has to be had about how you ultimately, myself included, benefit from anti-Blackness in this country um, by way of your, either your proximity to whiteness or your distance from this. And I think that's what people don't understand and it gets uncomfortable and this is literally my life. First, before I let you ask the next question, um, this uh, mom adopted her and long story but she was a teenager and we were friends and adopted her and um we moved around a lot as a, my mom, single mom so before she met my dad out the house one day i was coming home from seeing my abba and my mom's car was blown up completely blow. I'm, I mean, like a grenade in the car, the car had exploded. There was um, smoke and flames and things like that. Um, and there was a note on the door 
that said, get the N-word out of the house or die. I was six years old. So sorry, this is like super emotional for me to talk about. Um, these are like, it, this is like very real, like my life and my family that has been like, this is not watching videos on PBS and people are like, wow, that happened so long ago. No, this is happening every day. And it has continued to happen, honestly, the last 400 years. And so I think people have a distance from it. And so they're able to separate themselves and I'm not able to do that, um, which is why it makes me so passionate about that conversation. Of course, yeah. I um, have been very fortunate. I'm from Toledo, Ohio. And even though my dad's the only Black Jew and my siblings and I are the only mixed Jews, I haven't dealt with any of that discrimination, which I feel so fortunate about. But there's definitely a sense of, you know, like I, I don't see enough people that look like me or that like can relate to me. Right. Um, and then especially then you yeah. add on being a woman and then half black and then Jewish. And it's like that very unfortunate mix of uh, minority that especially those who tend to mm -hmm. be um, attacked or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's think. definitely. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just saying I completely agree. I mean, that's the intersections of your identity. Right. I mean, black women are. Malcolm X said it, but it's true. Black women are the most disrespected women or people on the planet. And you have the intersections of dealing with misogyny and being black and then anti-Semitism. And I truly believe that protecting black women has to be the job of all of us, um, especially non-black women who are in relationships with black men. Like we have to really understand that black women are who have birthed and created black people and there, we have to protect black women. I truly believe that. And I think on the other side of that, um, we also have to start having the stations of misogyny against Jewish women, um, which again, misogynoir, you experience on a whole other level because you're black as well. Um, but there's a lot of misogyny against Jewish women of all, you know, backgrounds, whether it's Jewish men calling us names or Jewish men <clears throat> berating and degrading us <clears throat> for how we speak or how we dress, um, or non-Jewish men, you know, with threats of sexual violence or just sexualizing us or slut shaming us. Um, I think these are really important conversations that have to be had for sure. <clears throat> yeah, so just real quick to back up, I know you used um, some words that not everyone who is with us today might be familiar with. Sure. Um, so I was wondering if you could define um, Mizrahi Jews and as well as Bakarin Jews. I believe that sure. sounds right. Yeah. Too many so <laughs> um, Mizrahi Jews are essentially Jews that after, during all the exile and all the, everything never left the Southwest Asia, North Africa region. Um, now many people use the word Sephardic, so it's really a personal choice. Um, Sephardic Jews can be one of two things. They can be Jews who had an experience after exile in Spain, Iberia, and then went elsewhere. Um, or more specifically, a lot of Jews that had an experience there actually ended up in places like Morocco and Syria and have lived side by side Mizrahi Jews forever. And because we share practice and culture, at one point we were all called Sephardic Jews. Um, but during the 70s, a very political movement in Israel, the term Mizrahi Jew formed. And so I'm personally more comfortable using that word because my family didn't have any experience anywhere else. They have been in Syria like for thousands of years. Um, so I identify as Mizrahi, but my family says Sephardic. It's really your, a personal choice. Um, Bukharan Jews are Jews who after exile ended up in Persia, but then were exiled from Persia and settled in Uzbekistan. Um, it's, a, it's a Central Asian um, sub-ethnic group, right? So Jewish is our ethnicity, but there are sub-ethnicities. So that's why Ashkenazi culture is very different than Mizrahi culture very different than Bukharan, but then we all share things. Like we all eat challah, we all eat matzah, we all, you know, have the same prayers, even if there's a little bit of a different way of doing them. Like some people, when they rip the challah on Shabbat, they place it on plates. Some people throw it on the table. Like depending on where your diaspora was, you might have different um, traditions, but essentially if you're Jewish, we're all connected through the same tribal religion. Um, so that's what Bukharan and Mizrahi means. And then just in case, Ashkenazi means basically Jews who after exile from Judea fled to Europe, specifically Eastern and Central Europe. 
it is not, does not mean European Jews. I like to be really specific about that. Russian Jews are Jews who lived in Russia and held citizenship in Russia. They are not ethnically Russian. Same with a Hungarian Jew. And most Ashkenazi Jews will reject those terms, Russian Jew, um, Polish Jew, et cetera, when speaking on even nationality because they were persecuted and never treated um, as equal citizens. So I just think it's always important to really understand that the same way an Ashkenazi Jew is not European, a Mizrahi Jew is not Arab. It just denotes our diaspora. And it really just shares more specifically our experience is an experience is in the diaspora but essentially we are all from judea and we are all judean or jewish yeah that was that was perfect like i don't think if i even like tried i'd be able to like come up with as like succinct as well as very explanatory of definition <laughs> take um, some practice but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so Obviously, it's like already if like whether you or secondarily you've like dealt with discrimination, like what advice would you give to people who are dealing with discrimination, whether it's they're Jewish or because of their skin color or whatever, like from just everything you've went through, do you ha have you found anything that works best or just like keeps your own mental health like better than other things? I definitely struggle with setting boundaries. So I'm going to give the best advice I can give. Um, so the first thing is, if you want to speak out about your experience of being harmed, your oppression, whether past or present, you should do that. You are the only person who gets to tell your story. Um, so it's up to you personally if you want to speak about it. If you don't want to speak about it, that's okay too. Because there's also resistance and there's also activism in just existing and being joyful and happy in your identity. And it's so important that we don't let our oppressors or those who seek to destroy us dictate how we connect to our identity, right? So let's just say Jewish, for example, anti-Semitism is on the rise, white supremacy, et cetera, et cetera. For me, every time I light the Shabbat candles or I wrap my hair and I share, those things are out of resistance because I am simply being Jewish without their stipulations, without their hate, I am simply existing, which is what they don't want me to do. I, I always tell my kids too, you know, my sons are like super educated, super aware of what's happening in the world. And my youngest son considers himself a young black Jewish revolutionary, right? And he, I mean, that really is his passion. He watches Fred Hampton and Bobby Seale and Huey Newton speeches and Angela Davis all day. And I told him, I said, talking about your oppression as a black Jewish person in America is critical and I support you, but you also have to find space and room for black joy because being black and living and being happy is so important. And it also is essentially the biggest revenge you're getting on those who wish otherwise for you. Um, I think that we diminish the importance of seeing black joy um, or seeing black fathers with their children or black mothers dancing and things like that. Like, so like I always tell my kid, I'm like, it's okay to talk about what you're feeling. I will never stifle you. You have your platform, you know, in private. I'm not, you know, but you also have to make sure that even if it's just an act of care, like retwisting your locks, something you have to find a way for you to connect with your identity as a black man or a Jewish man in a way that makes you happy and also makes you proud. Um, I think that's the most important thing is balance is making sure that you do not let your oppressors dictate how you relate to your relationship as a marginalized person. I hope that made sense. Yeah, no, that was perfect. Um, <laughs> Along those lines, slash also kind of segueing, can like just like your book, like one, it's fantastic. I love when I hear about authors because I think there's a lot of us who like always dream about either writing fiction or even just like even our own experiences. Um, so not only would I love for you to talk about your book, but also like the process of actually like having that like be created. So 
the book is called Ethnically Jewish. It's a PDF. It's an interactive ebook with history on Jewish people and the history of Israel, uh, white supremacy, all kinds of things. Um, the book was actually written by Ronit, who was my partner in Ethnically Jewish, but she has since stepped away from online um, due to abuse. And I edited the book and I found the pictures and things like that. So it was like a collaborative effort. She's just a better writer because I'll just writing with no commas, and, you know, and she's also a historian. So she wrote it, I edited it. And then together we basically proofed it and we created this. Honestly, I hate to say it like this, but it's a masterpiece. I mean, every person I've given the book to, whether Jewish or not, um, white or not, Arab has been like, this is such a nuanced, balanced book um, that has so much information. And it was, it was a labor of love, you know, for sure. And it's unfortunate that we had to stop running that ethnically Jewish page, but there was just so much harassment that it, it was really affecting our mental health. And we had to prioritize that first. Um, but I mean, I, you know, people can DM me on Instagram if they still want to buy the book. We still sell the book. It's a PDF, which means if you buy it, you can forward it to 10 of your best friends, which is why we wanted to create it in that format so that, you know, somebody was paying for the labor, but you can share with your friends. And the other thing about it that's really amazing, it's, it's interactive, meaning that if you click on something and there's a word hyperlinked, if you click on it, it's you to an article showing like academic research on that subject or it's going to give you links to videos you can watch on that subject so it's way more than just the written words on the page there's also like a ton of videos and articles linked into it that give you even more nuance um and information as well wonderful um so, yeah so what has been like your like, I guess in your like career as an activist or however you want to call it, I know earlier we talked about how it's just your, like, it's just who you are. Mm, um, yeah. How has that journey been for you? And how do you, how would you encourage other people who are like passionate about something to really take those first steps to be like an activist or whatever to like really get the ball rolling? I personally reject the term activist only because I feel like activist is somebody who's doing something in the streets, like who's actively in the community for several reasons. Look, I'm a mom. I work full time. I have severe anxiety. I can't do those things. Also, everything I write about or talk about is something that affects me my husband, my kids, my dad, my mom. So it's more of a personal life journey that I'm sharing of my observations and experiences. Um, someone called me a um, intellectual influencer. I was like, okay, I'll take that. Or an educator, <laughs> but really it's just me sharing experiences. Um, and I think that for me, that's, I think what sets apart my page too, is I'm, I, I'm really just talking about things that I experience that apparently a lot of people resonate with. And I think that's where you would want to start if you're looking to build some kind of platform. It takes a long time, especially when you're really authentic. When you're just being yourself, it takes longer to build your platform because people are going to realize that you're not going to waver on your opinions because you're not, you're not writing these opinions down because everyone else is talking about them. You're writing them because they're really part of who you are. So start a blog, start a Twitter, or start an Instagram page and just write what you want to write. I mean, yeah, especially for, you know, black Jewish women and Jewish women of color. I love to see just pictures. I think that in itself is a beautiful thing. And even Jewish men and, and especially, you know, Jewish people of all genders, like that are not meeting the stereotype of what people think Jews should look like. I think just having representation online is such a beautiful thing. I have I love to scroll and just see selfies of Jewish people lighting Shabbat candles or, you know, uh, creating jewelry or davening. Like, I think that those things have power in them as well. Even if you don't want to say a word and you just want to relay your experience through photographs, to me, photographs are one of the most powerful things. That's why I share my face all the time. Um, so, yeah, that would be my advice. <laughs> Um, could you talk more about like your 
journey like in like Jewishly and how like being Jewish obviously it's affected your life greatly um but like how would you say like the most impactful things really have been for you that have like coincided with your Judaism so growing up even after I cut ties with my biological father I always knew that I was Israeli I according to him I was Israeli before I was anything else. I'm not American. So I've never identified as American because that's just not how I was raised. Um, and just Israel and Israeli culture, Israeli history is a big part of who I am. But he never really talked to me about his family's experiences in the diaspora until I was like 30 years old. And that's when he was like, you know, I, I think it was around the time when we were having a lot of conversation about helping Syrian refugees and what was happening in Aleppo. And he called me and he's watching, you know, just the destruction of Aleppo. And he's just, his voice is like quivering. And I'm like, what's happening? So I reconnected with my biological father as an adult and then ended up cutting him off again. That's the little drama there in the middle. I'm like, what's going on? What's wrong? And he's like, so, you know, your grandfather, your Saba was born and raised in Aleppo. And I'm like, what? No, and he's like let me tell you a story and he tells me this story and i just i was speechless and then he starts telling me about my grandmother and how her family traveled from uzbekistan to jerusalem and lived in afghanistan my grandmother was actually born in afghanistan um and he's just telling me this story and i'm like why did you never tell me this as a kid like i just knew i was israeli like that was it and we were brown jews and you know and I was just like, my, it kind of shook my whole world um, because my mom's family never really talked about the Shoah. They never really talked about the oppression that they faced. They never spoke Yiddish. So my mom told me her grandparents spoke Yiddish, but it was only allowed in the house. And my grandparents never spoke it. Even though my mom went to yeshiva, my mom speaks Hebrew fluently. There was very little discussion about being Jewish. So it was like just a wild thing. And then around the same time I found that out, my mom's cousin reconnected with her after 30 years and sent me the story of her family in what I guess was then called, it was at that time it was like Hungary, like Hungary, Austria, the borders have changed and told us about all the parents and families that parents and children that didn't leave when my great grand great great grandfather left and subsequently was murdered in the Shoah. And I literally just like, I think I unplugged my phone for three days and I was just so, I was so overwhelmed um, because I realized like my, as Jews, we know that we have collective trauma. As Jews, we know that we've been through all these things for 3000 years, but to know that the, the people that raised you, the people that have loved you, the people you come from directly, like my grandparents went through these things personally and what they did to ensure that I could live and buy freely as a Jewish woman was mind blowing. I'm still trying to find someone to help me write a script because I'm like, this needs to be a movie. Um, because I just think these are stories that we don't hear. We don't hear enough about Israeli Jews and Bukharan Jews and Sephardic Jews. And we don't hear enough about Beta Israel and um, Rufusnik Refu- Jews, which are technically Ashkenazi, but their experiences are completely different in Russia. And I just think that there are so many stories that once we start to really unravel them and listen, it'll make people really connect with their identity in a very special way. At least it did for me personally. It just made me realize how much resistance and perseverance was like coursing through my veins. And that made me really proud. Yeah, I actually, unfortunately with COVID, I was planning on going to Preamble, what is it? Yes, Preamble, Alabama. I can remember it's a very small town in Alabama that like my dad's family is from. Um, and I wanted to do research there to learn more about my like black side because as I'm sure you know a lot of African Americans have no idea like anything about like yeah their ancestry from that route unfortunately COVID got a little bit in the way but it's still something I'm very um interested in learning about but I also have always been really connected to like my ancestors and in senior year I had to do an ancestry project um 
just learning more about what makes me me and like how people have what they've been through to get to me. Um, so I always love hearing other people's stories about how they also have like gotten to where they are and like all the people who have either suffered or just the things they did. Um, yeah. So obviously there's a lot of misconceptions in the Jewish community, especially the ideas of like only being like white Jews pretty much. Um, mm-hmm. What, h- how can like anyone, like me personally, Whitney, whoever else is here, um, since we're all obviously interested, how can we take those actions to make this perception of what Judaism is more accurate to what it actually is? So I think the first thing is to realize that with any ethnic group, the people that have the most proximity to whiteness are always the people that get the most representation. So that doesn't mean that they must be Ashkenazi. It doesn't mean anything. It means that anyone with proximity to whiteness, that could be a Sephardic Jew, a Mizrahi Jew, someone with proximity to whiteness is always going to have most representation. Now in America, because 90% of American Jews are Ashkenazi and also because America loves to paint themselves as the savior in the Shoah, which is not actually true, we really only hear about Ashkenazi culture, Ashkenazi history, um, and representation. And of course, as an Ashkenazi Jew, that is super important. It's a beautiful culture. Um, And the history is critical to learning also about America because the Holocaust, for example, was modeled after Jim Crow. So I think the connections between Black history and Jewish history are so intricately connected in this country, it is so important we learn about it. On the flip side of that, I think we have to really also make room to hear about other stories um, because, for example, my mom's family, we grew up eating Ashkenazi food. I love Ashkenazi food. I don't care what anybody says. I'm probably the only mixed Jew that will say that, but I love Ashki food. I can eat Manischewitz gefilte fish by the jar. I don't care. But I also love Mr. Rahi food, right? But so her experiences were completely different. And so growing up, when I would eat other things or even just going to school. So growing up, I was, you know, I haven't been out the house in a year, but I'm actually brown. And growing up, I was identifiably a brown girl. There was no denying that. I was very dark. I would constantly be questioned or my mom would be questioned and they'd be like, oh, did you adopt her? Where are you from? Oh, she's so exotic. Oh, you eat that food, so you must be Arab. Those things perpetuated not just by non-Jewish people, but by Jewish people because there was so little education and so little representation on Mizrahi Jews, on Sephardic Jews, on other Jews. So those things caused myself and others to be either erased or diminished as valid Jews. Like literally growing up, I thought that the only Jews that looked like me were Israeli until I realized that the majority of Israel is Mizrahi and Sephardic, which is why, you know, they look like me. Um, So I just think like, it's so important. It's also important to realize that Jews are not monolithic. So, you know, someone might assume Gal Gadot is Sephardic or Oded Fair is Mizrahi. They are both Ashkenaz Jews and they're just very Semitic looking. So I think the most important thing to remember is Ashkenazi culture history is not the default of our community. There's so much more. Anyone that looks non-white should be represented, whether it's Ashkenazi or Mizrahi, because we want to see more Jews that look like that so that people understand that we are not just the Seth Rogans of the world, right? Um, And so I think we just have to really open up those avenues to showcase those people. I have a friend who's 100% Ashkenazi, like 100%. She has the tightest curls and she is super brown. And when I first met her, I actually thought that she was Jewish. And she was like, I am not black. I want to make that clear. Like, I don't want to, you know, appropriate any. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I just assumed when we were talking about like history and I was like, yeah, you know, as a black Jewish woman, she's like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, I'm not. And I was like, oh my God, like, I couldn't believe it. And she was like, yeah, it happens a lot. And she's fully Ashkenazi. And she said that someone like her being Ashkenazi, she doesn't get to see people like her who are also Ashkenazi represented. So it's so important to understand like, yes, we need more Mizrahi representation, more Sephardic representation. We also need to showcase 
Ashkenazi Jews of color, black Ashkenazi Jews. We really need to showcase that too, because again, it's universal in the world that even if it's Arab, whoever has the most proximity to whiteness, whether by appearance or by history, is who's always going to be centered. Um, you know, it's like you look at magazines in all parts of Asia, it's always the lightest skin women that are on the magazines. Colorism is really critical to discuss. And, it, and you know, I understand some people are like, oh, but, you know, Jews are Jews, a Jew. But these experiences don't erase that. It just makes us stronger to realize that some of us are underrepresented. Um, so that, that to me is really, that's really it. It's like, don't speak in monolithic terms. Don't refer to Ashkenazi as white Jews, you know, because that's erasing so many Ashkenazi Jews that do not look white. It's also, you know, ethnically, no Jew is ethnically white. Race and ethnicity are not the same thing. Um, so it's really important to understand when we say ethnically Jewish, we're saying not European. They are not European. You know, looking white and being European are two completely different things. Um, I reject Ashkenazis being referred to as European Jews. I think it's really problematic and I think it really is harmful. I know that I would never want someone to call me a Hungarian Jew when my family was massacred in Hungary for not being Hungarian. Um, same with being Syrian, et cetera. So I just think it's important that we really make space for all stories. Um, and I just wanna see more um, Jewish organizations shed light on you know, Jews of color, black Jews, regardless of background. Um, I also wanna see the same for patrilineal Jews and LGBTQ Jews. I want to see more inclusivity and not tolerance. That word. I want to see support and love for all Jews, whether you're Orthodox, whether you're, you know, secular, whether you're atheist, I don't really care. I think that as we create our community to be more expansive and show everyone, then the outside world is going to end up slowly being more welcoming of us. But if within our community, we're isolating people and making them feel unwelcome, then they're going to see that. And it's just going to get mirrored by other people that are non-Jewish. So I think we have to work on ourselves before we can expect anybody else to treat us a certain way. Of course, that makes like perfect sense. Um, and real quick, I just want to remind people that you can put questions in the chat. We are kind of starting to get to our question portion of it, but I wanted to make kind of like the first time I think I've seen like a black and white Jew who wasn't my sister or my brother mm. um, was on my birthright trip. And that was like the most exciting experience I have ever had. Like I was like, I need to get to know you because oh. like you said it's all about you want to see people who look like you. Yes, but, that, yeah, so that, was, that, that was matters. So fun. <laughs> I, I, I don't think people and I don't mean this in a bad way, but I feel like people who meet very Eurocentric white standards of beauty do not understand what it is and how empowering it is to see people that look like you when you've always been othered. And I've always been othered. I've always been asked, what are you? Why are your eyebrows so thick? Why are your eyes so dark? Why are you, you know, where are you from? That is very frustrating, especially as a little kid. My kids went through the same thing. So when they started to meet black Jewish people, it was very empowering for them. Um, and I also think just to add in there quickly, we also need to really be very, uh, very proactive on making these Jewish spaces also safe for Israeli Jews, because we can't boast about Jewish values and Jewish community and keep making Israelis feel so isolated. There's been so many Jewish spaces that I've wanted to participate in and be part of, but because I'm Israeli, I did not feel welcome. Um, and, you know, I don't want to get into a political discussion. Like, that's the whole thing is like, I should be able to simply be allowed to exist as an Israeli Jew, regardless, again, Mizrahi, Ashkenazi, Sephardic, I don't care. We should be able to exist as Israeli Jews in Jewish spaces without litmus tests um, by other Jews. You know, we know all Jews go through litmus tests by non-Jews, but within the Jewish community, Israeli Jews are constantly put through litmus tests or, we hear people say things like, oh, well, I'm not Israeli, 
well, don't make it sound like it's a bad thing. Like don't other us, like we're those Jews on the other side of the, you know what I mean? So I think that's also a really port, uh, important part of that discussion as well. Yeah, I love my time in Israel. Again, so mad at COVID. I luckily got my birthday trip in literally like a month before everything went crazy. Um, but I really wanted to go back this summer, but you know, we're just waiting on things. But I remember yeah. actually in Israel, I had like a lot of people tell me that I look like just random strangers be like, you're so beautiful. And like, I had never heard that a lot, like in the US. Oh. Um, so that was just another thing that was like, so fantastic. It's definitely, um, I never feel more comfortable than I do when I'm surrounded by Israeli women and Israeli people. I just, I, I, I just feel comfortable. I feel safe. I, I just do. Um, yeah. So I get it. <laughs> I totally get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I know earlier, again, people, please feel free to ask questions. This is not only the Maddie McQueen show. Um, <laughs> asking Yasmin all of my personal questions. Um, you told me you had some like reading material. Like, I'm sure oh, yeah. That is. I actually forgot one of the books over there, but that's okay. So this one I haven't read yet, so I'm not going to recommend it because I don't like to do that. Um, so two books that I would strongly recommend, well, three, if you're learning, looking to learn more about Mizrahi Sephardic Jews and not just their history in the diaspora, but how they were treated at the inception of Israel, which is a very complicated and nuanced conversation rooted in power dynamics, colorism, Orientalism, very traumatic, something people really don't like that I talk about, but I think we have to heal. Like the only way to heal is to talk about it. Um, so these two books are, the first one is Uprooted um, by Lynn Julius. And it's basically how 3000 years of Jewish civilization in the Arab world vanished overnight. And it talks about our presence in Southwest Asia, North Africa for 3000 years. Um, it talks about oppression it talks about I mean everything it this book is amazing um the other book I'm actually in the middle of reading but I had to take a break to be honest because I was starting to get really emotional um is called spies of no country secret lives at the birth of Israel and it basically is the story of four Mizrahi Jews who were Mossad or spies for Israel um, you know, during the very early days. And it, it talks about not just the war so that you really see how Arabs viewed us, but it also talks about how these Jews were treated by other Jews in the early stage of Israel and how Orientalism and xenophobia came into play. And I think it's really critical to understand these stories because most people don't even know, for example, in the 70s, there was a movement called the Israeli Black Panthers that was modeled after, after the American Black Panthers, which basically confronted the xenophobia, Orientalism, colorism that Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews faced in Israel by Ashkenazi Jews that were not Black. Um, it's really important to understand that history because, you know, people get really upset and mad at me and I you know, why are you talking about this? And you're demonizing. The thing is, this trauma is something that was embedded in my head since I was a little girl. I, under, I was told as a little girl that I would never be treated equal, never be, be viewed as equal because I'm Mizrahi. That, you know, even in the eighties when I was born, I don't want to say my birth year, but early eighties when I was born, I was actually viewed as a mixed Jew and it was very taboo that my mother, an Ashkenazi woman, married a Mizrahi man. So these things, I think younger Jews get really upset by these conversations and they feel like it's divisive, but they don't understand that many of us are living with this trauma that we carry down from our parents and they carried from their parents um, specific to being Mizrahi or Sephardic, not necessarily just Jewish. So these books I would suggest, and also a book called Miriam's Song, um, it's actually about a Moroccan Jew and her family flees uh, Morocco for Israel. And it talks again about their experiences um, as Jews, but also as Moroccan Jews and dealing with, at that time, the Ashkenazi elite and how they were made to feel other and how they were made to feel 
inadequate. You know, she was like embarrassed by how her father dressed and talked and what they ate because none of the other Jews did that. So it really is a, a really great, these are great books to just kind of delve into the nuances and power decks um, in the history of these groups of Jews, I think. Yeah, I, I always love, I'm a big reader. Um, so I always love finding new reading material. <laughs> Um, especially, you know, some, you know, that are more, I guess, like educational too, especially, I think a lot of times, especially as college students, um, it's easy to be like, ah, this is my time to not read educational stuff. Like when you have free time, because I've just been reading a whole bunch of educational right. stuff, but I think it's really important. And even like a Jewish trait, you know, study and to like learn more, especially for your own pursuits rather than just what like XYZ professor told you to talk about. Absolutely. And there's also, um, I'll just throw this in there. See. If anyone follows me on Instagram, um, in my link tree, there's actually a link to a free, completely free documentary on Mizrahi activism in the 70s. Um, and it's the story of Vicky Shiran and what she went through as a Mizrahi Jew in Israel. So if anyone's interested, it's, it's in my link tree on Instagram. It's completely free. You don't have to sign up and you can watch this documentary. And I think learning this history would be really eye-opening for people to understand um, where some of us are coming from and just provide like more nuance and, um, you know, context. Of your Instagram, when did you start using it as an educational tool? Like, how did that like present itself to you? And like, how did you really like, I guess, hone it and take advantage of that platform? So this is my second Instagram page. My first one was actually targeted by anti-Semites and got taken down by Instagram. So I had to make a new one. The way it started was my page actually started as a makeup page. And I would post selfies and review foundation, especially as, I mean, this lighting is terrible, but I'm very olive complexion. So I have a very green undertone and finding foundation was like almost impossible. I could rarely find something that matched my skin um, because it would be pink. And then I would look like I was like flushed and I was like, this is horrible. So I started reviewing different foundations um, and at the time concealers for my under eyes, which I don't use anymore. And I did like a video about under eyes and eyebrows. And someone was like, oh my goodness, you, are you Arab? You're so beautiful. And I was like, no, I'm Jewish. And they were like, what? And it started this whole conversation on Middle Eastern Jews and Mizrahi Jews. And the next thing I knew, I started hashtagging my pictures, Jewish beauty and the next thing I knew, I had like 400 Jewish followers. And then around that time, me and my, my Abba reconnected briefly where he sent me the actual stories of my grandparents. And so then I started to delve into that history. And then I just started to like make posts with my pictures of makeup, but in the caption sharing history and it just took on like a life of its own. And then I really started to delve into like Mizrahi history specifically um, and things like that. And I don't even know, it just kind of took on a mind of its own. Um, but it really just started from posting selfies and, and people being like, you're Jewish. How are you Jewish? You look Arab and things like that. Um, and then here we are today. <laughs> so... <laughs> It snowballed quite quickly. <laughs> yeah, it did. I've been on Instagram now. I mean, obviously two pages, but doing this for like four years, four and a half years, something like that. Yeah, and how, um, like, how has your like, I guess, interaction with the virtual community been with that? Whether it is just the Jewish community or being able to like even educate people outside of that. Oh yeah. No, I, I, so I have very specific boundaries. I don't answer all my DMS and I, I don't, you know, do labor in my DMS anymore because it was just too time consuming, but I do have a rule that if you are, um, black and you want information or you want to learn, I will absolutely provide that information 
for you. You can DM me, you can Zoom with me, send a copy of the book, because I believe that Black and Jewish solidarity, meaning non-Jewish Black people and non-Black Jewish people, in order for that to happen, we have to bridge that gap where there's lack of information because all of our history has been so whitewashed. So Whereas like, honestly, if a white non-Jewish person messages me, like, I want more information, I'm like, great, you can email me and schedule a paid consultation. But, you know, when someone reaches out like, hey, I want to understand this. And I see, especially they're a black woman. I'm like, yeah, what do you, you know, what information are you looking to know? Because I feel like it's my responsibility um, to do that. And so, and I really believe heavily as well in like paying reparations to black people, things like that. So any, even education I can give for free, you want it, I'll give it. So my DMs are very specific and close to certain people. Um, if we're friends, we're talk. But I've met so many people. And I think sometimes people tend to forget also, like I'm most, I'm probably one of the oldest in the Jewish community as far as Instagram pages. People tend to like talk to me like, like I'm their age. And I'm like, <laughs> I, can, I can literally be your mother. So... You know, I had to set really strict boundaries because I think it's important for people to remember that our experience is you as a 22 year old Jewish person may have a very different view on things than I do because I'm, I'm like 40 years old. Like my life has been very different. So um, I've had to just be very, you know, clear on that. But I love my followers. I, I, I do. Um, and I think that the community is much smaller than maybe other pages, but it's a very tight knit one. And one where we're always talking and learning from each other. And I'm very thankful for that. So two questions before we have to wrap up. I, I definitely need to be contacting you outside of this because you're just amazing. Um, and you do look very young. I will say like, I thought you were in your twenties. So power to you. Oh. <laughs> no, um, I have an 18 year old and a 16 year old. <laughs> well, you look beautiful. <laughs> um, so one, have you ever thought about walking away from Instagram, even though from what it sounds like, maybe not so much, but you know, haters, I guess, like the um, more slang for it now. And then how, what, what words do you want to leave us with about like growth and like um, just kind of being more than what we are? now like tikkun olam almost like that kind of idea sure I have thought about walking away um and there's gonna come a time when I probably will but I've also changed my content over the last two years I used to talk about Israel and Israeli history a lot I didn't even realize I lost an earring um <laughs> I used to talk about Zionism a lot um but it became too emotional for me, um, too triggering because these are the things that without those things, I would not be here. It's like literally I personally, not Jewish people, I personally wouldn't be here. So I just had to stop talking about it because I was getting threats and I was getting harassment. And I'm like, you know what? I don't need to share this to myself with people. I don't need to constantly discuss it. So I moved away from it and I've moved into more Jewish representation and more lighthearted things as well as just Jewish pride. And that's what I'm going to leave you guys with is I think the most important thing is however you relate to your Judaism, whether you're religious or not, if it's just that you wear your Mag and David with pride, whatever it is that you do to relate to your Jewishness is not wrong because it's what you decided. And the most important thing is to not let anybody dictate to you how you do that you're valid. I don't care if you're a convert. I don't care if you're an ethnic Jew who's an atheist. I don't care if you're patrilineal, um, gay, trans, interfaith marriage. All Jews are valid. And on my page, all Jews are, are loved and welcomed. And the other thing is to remember that you're going to meet people with very different experiences from you, with very different opinions from you. As long as someone is not being racist or violent towards you, it's okay to unfollow. It's okay to block someone, even if you don't want to see their content anymore, but let's just like really protect each other online. Um, don't harass people. Don't 
constantly DM them or post their names in your stories or comment incessantly because we are all human beings dealing with our own trauma, our own experiences. And so even if we don't agree with each other, we should really be protecting each other and making sure that we're not opening up room for anti-Semites to come and harm us. Same time, same token, we need to have intra-community conversations that are hard because as I said, I'm an older Jew and these things I talk about have shaped and molded who I am. And I have a lot of pain that I wanna let go of. And I think part of that is talking about it. Um, so I would say just exist as you are, be proud of who you are and make the same space for other people that are Jewish as well, even if you do not understand it or relate to it. That's it. Sorry, for a second there, it was like frozen. And I was like, are you still saying things? Again, I was like, uh... part of Zoom. <laughs> Um, but yeah, those are, yes, authenticity has always been like, as I get older, like a really big part of who I am, obviously, like, because I'm being my authentic self, or at least trying to, so I really like hearing um, yeah. those words from you. Exactly. Thank you so, exactly. so, 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 so much, Yasmin. You're welcome. For being vulnerable, for being your authentic self, for constantly speaking your truth. Um, and just for letting us highlight you in this way, we are really grateful. And I hope this is the beginning of a beautiful learning relationship, not just the beginning and the end. Um, and Maddie, as always, just can't wait for your talk show to come out. Uh, <laughs> if you are interested in a more uh, Women Crush Wednesday speaker series, we are running every Wednesday until mid-April, I believe. So next week we are, Maddie will be interviewing Amy Kritzer from, Amy Becker now, from uh, What You Want to Eat. So we are very excited to continue the conversations and we are again, thank you so much Yasmin and I hope that I can't express to you enough how much it's just wonderful to hear, especially, you know, this space of welcoming the Jew, our welcoming our brothers and sisters where, wherever they are on their journey, whoever they are, however they identify, that is what we do at Hillel, that is who we want to be at the Hillel Miami University. For whatever, wherever a student is on their Jewish journey, we want to be supportive and offer them a safe space. Um, so thank you so much for bringing that home. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's so our pleasure. Have a wonderful, healthy, safe rest of your week and a very early good job. You too. Shabbat shalom. Bye. Yes, you too. Shabbat shalom. Bye. Thank you so much.